Hi, my name's Phil. I like discussing politics and what I want to do in this video is to go through some of the figures involved in judging how much we're going to lose, particularly if we crash out of the EU with no deal at all. Uh, it's quite ironic really. I was thinking of doing this last night based on a few comments and then woke up this morning and someone was saying, hey, why don't you do a video uh, which can look at how much the Treasury is going to lose by crashing out the EU like this? Well, ironically, I was doing just th such that. Now, the mass itself is very, very simple. It's childishly simple to understand and you can see how much we're actually going to lose. And, and bear in mind, I want to be fair to some of the Brexiteers, particularly the ones uh, posting comments. They disagree with me wildly. But what none of the, well, very few of them are doing is saying that we'll be economically better off. Uh, some of them recognise that we will never be economically better off. Some of them recognise that we will not be economically better off, at least for some time. Um, whereas there are some who think it's going to be immediate, the benefits. And these were the people who were fooled by the big red bus. Uh, so there's a few things I'm going to explain in there as well, little thought exercises. But let's just get down to some of the easiest maths on it. So what happened was uh, the, the Leave campaign produced this bus. This was not produced by the government, remember, but then the government were campaigning for staying in anyway. Um, and since then, any number of uh, senior Tory MPs have also denied having anything to do with it, even though they posed in front of it. And what this bus said was, why don't we save the £350 million we currently give to the EU and spend it on the NHS? Now, anyone falling for that should have been uh, should have been alerted to the fact that conservatives and far not all of them conservatives, but far right wing Brexiteers were suggesting they spend money on the NHS. That should have been your first clue. But the second one is the idea that we pay three hundred and fifty million pounds a week to the EU is simply untrue. Um, let's go through what we actually do. And for these figures, by the way, the figures I'm going to use today, I'm going to use the ones that were true at round about the referendum. Obviously, it would be unfair to use the very latest ones because it actually makes it worse, the very latest ones. Um, but of course, they, you know, we're talking about figures that they were coming up with at the time of the referendum. So I will use the figures that applied at that time as well. So our EU membership fee, £18.6 billion a year. Now, if you divide that by the 52 weeks, you get £358 million, and that's where they got their figure from. However, although our membership fee is £18.6 billion, we don't give that much to the EU. You see, we have this little thing called the rebate, and actually it's not so little. So our rebate was £5.6 billion a year. So when you take that off, our actual fee, the amount we give to the EU, if you're going to call it that, is actually £13 billion a year. Now, when you divide that by your 52 weeks, you get £250 million. So straight away, they've straight up lied about that. And the Office for National Statistics did, did give them a telling off. Obviously, all my figures come from the Office for National Statistics. These are independent. These come up with the actual facts of the matter. Um, I mean, they've actually had to be bollocking politicians. Ever since David Cameron took office, in actual fact, they've been telling off uh, the, the, the government for and, and others as well for completely lying. I mean, everyone knows that politicians spin statistics um, to mislead as much as possible. But, you know, the, for the last like eight years, they've been telling outright lies about it. And this was another one. So, you know, it's 250 million. So you can still think to yourself, well, 250 million a week sounds like a lot to me. Ah, but we haven't finished. Because we still really don't even pay that net. Because then there are subsidies. So British industries, farming is particularly well known for this, receive EU subsidies as a result of that. So that was four billion that year. Um, so you take that off and that's a net of nine billion that we are contributing to the EU. So then we go from 350 million a week to 173 million a week. So that's slashed in half straight away. So they've got the figure cut. But again, some people will be still saying at this point, but that's still us as a net contributor to the EU. And I've even seen comments like that below. But no, we are not net contributors. That's simply removing the rebate and the subsidies. That's not the main reason for being in the EU. People are completely forgetting why Britain joined the EU. We didn't want to join the organisation as the EEC was at the time uh, from the start because we didn't see the benefit. It was only when we saw the economic benefits we wanted to get involved. Why we joined it was for trade, 
to improve our trade, to improve our industries, uh, to make more money, to massively increase our GDP. So the value of trade. Now, if we just look at the value of trade with the EU on its own, that was worth for that year £235.8 billion. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that we take that from the nine billion we've got left over. We would still we still traded with the EU before and we would still trade with the EU afterwards. But this is where we need to start to think of a few things. There are there's a certain amount of trade we know we would lose, by the way, if we crashed out with no deal. We know that for certain. I'm going to go through the figures for that. There's other amounts of trade where it's a bit more unknown. So try and imagine a business owner who runs a small business, employs, let's say, 50 people, something like that. It's a moderate sized business. And let's say they're a manufacturing business. Now, the worst case scenario is that this particular business gets hit twice by the tariffs. Once in terms of the raw materials that they need to come into their factory or, or whatever. Um, and it could be that either that's because they have to import it from especially worse if it's from the EU, because at the moment they don't pay any tariffs at all. But maybe other parts of the world where they do pay tariffs, but not as much as they're going to. Um, but they, you know, they're going to pay that way. But it may be that they source their local materials from the UK. But maybe where they source it from <coughs> has to get stuff in from the EU or elsewhere as well. So they would have to raise their prices. So there could still be an increase in the cost of the raw materials they need to get in. But then if they're trading with the EU or indeed the rest of the world, but the EU, again, is where the situation is much worse, then that means there's going to be tariffs on that. Their goods are all of a sudden more expensive in Europe. And they've had to increase if they're going to maintain their profits. And let's say it's a company, a company that size is not usually going to make ridiculous profits um, unless it's a huge luxury item uh, producer. Then it's very likely they're going to have to increase their their prices to take account of both the, the tariffs on the goods they're bringing in and the tariffs on, on their sales in Europe. In a situation like that, the, the prices are going to increase significantly and they're going to lose out to competitors. Um, the, the only way they would still be able to trade, so businesses are going to fold when you consider the sheer number of businesses that not only import but export um, between UK and the rest of the EU. There, there are going to be businesses fold. There are going to be people lose their jobs. But here's the thing. The, the only ways they'd still be able to carry on trading, and a number will, is one, they're really the only ones who supply it. Or let's say the demand for this product is so high that it can't simply be stepped up by other organisations already within the EU. Over time it can, because people in the EU will see a gap in the market and, and more factories will be built and all the rest of it. But in the short term, let's say that they still need to buy it. They're just going to have to swallow the higher price for it. Or if it's luxury items, maybe there's a place that produces super high quality, I don't know, handbags. Or what I actually know that there's master watch builders in the UK that produce very unique watches. You know, but obviously that's, you know, they produce a very small number and it's to very high end clients. That's not going to make a big dent in our economy. Um, but in general, if it was luxury items, let's say, you know, more mass produced luxury items regional foods, that sort of thing. Um, it's the only place you can get it, so that would still trade at the higher prices. The only other way to do it, if you're a business and you think to yourself, right, well, you know, I'm gonna, my business is gonna fold here unless I can maintain my prices and I've got to swallow up those tariffs, but I can't do that, my profit margins are too tight. Your only alternative is in that one is efficiency savings, which ultimately always means job losses. It means you have to make redundant a load of your workers, um, and either automate or just put that extra work on the ones who remain. So the ones who remain have to do maybe twice as much work for no extra pay, something like that. Um, that's the only way of doing it. That is the only way. So whether that business goes under or not is entirely dependent on how unique is their product, how difficult is it to get it throughout the rest of the EU, because it is going to be more expensive now, and will people be prepared to pay for that price? If not, they're going to have to cut costs in their business. And cutting costs in a business means job losses. you know. Um, but, so those sort of things, we don't know. We don't know. But there is an amount of trade that we absolutely know we are going to be losing. So I'm going to come to that in a minute. So look at this. Trade with the EU, 235.8 billion in that year. In order 
for us to have that 9 billion so-called saving wiped out, we'd need to lose 3.8% of our trade with the EU. Um, that's all it would be needed. That's, that is it. And who's going to believe that actually most of our trade will be fine when it's suddenly a lot more expensive? Um, you know, you imagine suddenly things becoming 20% more expensive. Think about all the things you buy, whether it's a new car, new television, uh, or something more modest, just like your groceries. If a product suddenly costs 20% more, but there's another one right next to it on the shelf, might you not change, you know, brand, so to speak? Many people, some of you will be going, no, 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 of course I would not. Uh, but realistically, you would. And, um, and, and so will members of the EU. So we'll easily be losing more than that. But of course, our trade overseas is also going to be affected, not just in the EU. Um, that's a bit tricky because at the moment it's very easy to tell with the EU because we've got uh, no tariffs at the moment. With the rest of the world, we have tariffs. Those tariffs will just go up. Uh, so, you know, I'm certainly not going to go through every little bit of trade and try and work out the extra cost. I'm sure other people have done that. But our trade with the whole world at that point, our overseas exports, was worth $519.9 billion. So on those figures, we'd only have to lose 1.7% trade. In other words, 1.7% of our exports would just need to be unsold. And all of a sudden, we've wiped out that $9 billion. But here's what the government now knows. Now, I want to, before I say this, just also mention one other little statistic. This is a prediction. Economists were predicting that if we leave the EU, and this was based on the assumption we leave with a deal, that in ten, within 10 years, we'll be... 50 billion pounds a year worse off 50 billion okay uh, that is nearly three times the value of our uh, membership eu membership okay that's how mad that is but that's a prediction and i know that all the objections to this are going to be oh well, that's just a prediction what do they know what do experts know yes i know you don't like experts people who actually know what they're talking about you don't appreciate them i get that so here we go this is what the government has uh, this government figures they know that we are going to lose, in the event of crashing out with no deal, we are definitely going to lose 12% of our trade at least. They know that because uh, of contracts we have that will be null and void uh, without a deal. Um, that we will not be able to, that, that amount of trade will be completely lost, certainty. There will be other trade as well, but that's more unpredictable. Because that's down to individual business owners, if they can stay competitive or not. Okay, 12% represents an annual loss on based on those figures of 53.4 billion so if we go out with no deal at all we will lose in fact i think that value lost yeah that actually takes account of the 9 billion i already re, in actual fact i'm going to say it's worth more than 60 billion but i took the 9 billion off that we're saving god i hate doing their quotes um <laughs> But um, what that means is that immediately over the first year, we will be 53.4 billion down. And that's not including businesses that will also lose their trade that we can't actually predict with certainty. This is the certainty. So it won't take 10 years for us to be 50 billion pounds a year worse off. It will be immediate. Um, and that's why I've said in the past, if we did crash out with no deal, the only thing, I mean, it would be a terrible situation. It would be devastating. The only little thing keeping me sane would be, well, in a year's time, there will be no denying it. All the people who are saying Brexit's a great idea, they will all have to melt away. Because not only, they won't even be able to use the excuse. I know some people are thinking, well, they'll just use the excuse. It was badly handled. They won't even be able to say that because those same people were saying that no deal would actually be fine. And um, so you, there's no hiding from it. There's no, because the no deal doesn't need managing at all. You know, a no deal is a no deal. There's, there's no deal. And uh, and all the lies would come out. Every, I mean, to anyone who pays attention, they've already come out. But there would be zero denying it. And I'll tell you something else. Communities would be so badly hit by it that anyone publicly saying that they were very much in favour of this, uh, I would fear for their safety because it's one thing to get on your high horse based on what you've been reading in the sun and to get politically indignant. When it comes down to it, when people lose their jobs and then potentially lose their homes, 
and then the certain proportion of those will also have a breakdown in their their family life and and again going down um some of those people will commit suicide i mean this is how i look at it brexit particularly with no deal is going to mean people lose their lives and anyone who has called for no deal in that scenario one year later has blood on their hands because they will be responsible directly responsible for every single person that died as a direct result of it and this is how serious this is this is how serious it is because we know this we know that when people lose their jobs and can't get another um, they're very likely to lose their homes you know and it doesn't matter whether they had a mortgage or were renting the government will not you know pay them enough to stay in, in that home they'll have had that have to find cheaper accommodation often they can't often it's not supplyable and if people lose their jobs en masse then there really is not the housing, housing to do it. Um, and in a situation like that, you know, relationships can break down. But even if they don't, people do commit suicide when they have gone from being nice and stable, life's great, to financial ruin, they can't cope. You know, some people, maybe if they've been on in, in poverty for years, it's terrible, but they manage, they cope. But if you're suddenly plunged into it when you were managing before, uh, you can't cope. And so, yeah, people will die. People will die. But those are the figures, uh, just to get back on, on, on track there. Um, you know, the, there is zero way in which you can say that we're not going to lose out. You know, this idea that we are a net contributor to the EU is a complete lie. It's not even a matter of opinion. It is a complete lie um, because only a fool is going to say that we're not going to lose any trade with the EU or the rest of the world when all of a sudden our goods are more expensive. Only a fool is going to say that. And of course, if we don't sell as much stuff, that means as a country we don't have as much money. That means we can't import as much anyway. We are already, and we have been for some years, uh, importing more than we're exporting anyway um, in terms of goods. You know, where we've generally propped it up is, is largely services. Uh, but of course, the services, I mean, that was the irony. Even with May's deal, you know, services were completely off the menu. They weren't even negotiating services because they know there's no chance. We already know that even if Brexit was completely reversed and we never actually went through it, we already suffer because people are not going to be waiting to see what we do. You know, they need to make sure their businesses carry on running. So English speaking banking services, for example, have started cropping up in other countries in the EU. Uh, so, you know, for example, our financial services even if Brexit is cancelled, they will have still lost a chunk of business because other businesses have now sprouted up to take over that. Same with other, other types of services as well. I mean, for, for, for services, to have a trade deal with services, we have to allow movement anyway. So if we're going to say we're not allowing the movement, we, that's an, a complete no-go. Um, Boris Johnson keeps talking about the use of technology when it comes to goods. Yeah, when we can have a thing when we've got driverless lorries and ferries and things like that, yeah, there may come a point where technology allows us... I mean, we could already, already, in theory, have the technology to scan goods as they come in, but we don't have that technology. It simply exists, but we haven't bought it in, so we don't have that to begin with. But yeah, maybe in the far future it's possible to trade goods without trade uh, free movement of people. But when it comes to services, no, no, not at all. Um, so that's why they're not even negotiating that. They know we've lost those. So, yeah. But there we go. Um, hopefully that's uh, understandable. I, I, I would think that's understandable to a five-year-old, quite frankly. Uh, but let me know what you think in the comments below. If you've enjoyed the video, don't forget to click the like button. Subscribe for further content. And don't forget to click the bell notification and share with other people who may also be interested. And until next time, I'll see you later.